The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, You are the light of the, the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden under by foot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But he who does them and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you. <clears throat> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for you have given us that which permits us to be light and salt. You have given us your Son. Help us to walk in his pathways, to hear his call, and understand our identity in him. Prepare us, Lord, each time we come into your house to pray, to hear your word, and to share in a meal together, that having done so, we would go out to fulfill the purpose and mission to which you have called your son and to which you have called his living body in the world. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and salvation. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus is not Jimmy Buffett. You're like, duh. Jesus did not lose his shaker of salt. Jimmy Buffett did. Our Lord knows exactly where those shakers of salt are really are they are right here sitting next to you in fact they are the very ones that you look at in the morning you brothers and sisters are salt of the earth hallelujah that's good news how do we become the salt of the earth. Is it a long process? I mean, I, I love this bit. Jesus starts, you know, this portion. You know, obviously, we're continuing the, the, the Sermon on the Mount. And he doesn't look out into the crowd and say, one day you will be the salt of the earth. He says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light to the world. This gives pastors, on this morning at least, following the lectionary, an opportunity to reflect on Christian vocation. For us to remember what it means to be followers of Jesus Christ. We serve a God who does wonderful things for us already. Our hearts are warmed by the very fact of the idea of the sun rising this morning. What has God done for me lately? All you have to do is remember the, next, the last breath you took. We serve a God who has given us 
all things already. So Christian vocation arises out of the premise of a gracious God. He has called us, therefore, to respond likewise. I mean, sometimes when we get into this conversation about what it is that Christians are supposed to go out and do, we Lutherans get a little bit itchy. Because it sounds a little bit at times like works righteousness. I remember a, 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 a homiletics professor had always told me we were going to talk about what God did for the world, not what humans do. Okay, to a certain extent, I would I absolutely agree with that. That's, the, that's where we start. And in fact, if you go back into the Old Testament, if you go back into the very beginning of the law itself, the very Ten Commandments, what is it that starts the Ten Commandments? A little, little pastor point quiz here. What is it? How does the Ten Commandments start? I, obviously, we, we know that the, the words there, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. But in reality, I would suggest that the Ten Commandments start before that. I have brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the hands of Pharaoh, out of the bondage of his hand. Therefore... You shall have no other gods before me. What has God already done for us so much? In Christ, throughout the history of all history, we serve a God that is not a, if you do this, then I'll do that God. No, we serve a God who has already given us everything that we could ever hope for, much less desire. So Jesus intros the Sermon to the Mount, of course, with the Beatitudes, which detail the, the blessedness of discipleship. That only after Jesus assures the disciples of God's goodness does he call on them. Therefore, vocation is a response to the grace, grace and mercy of God. Paul tells us a little bit about that today in our second lesson. He says that no eye has seen. No ear he heard, nor the hearts of men conceive what God has prepared for those who love him. And if you look throughout our lessons for today, the concept itself of Christian vocation is described. The word vocare comes from the word vocation. We, we think automatically, okay, what is it that you do with your lives? Well, in, in many ways, that's kind of the difference between occupation and, and vocation. Many of us have, will have different occupations in our life. In fact, you know, they tell you that, that uh, someone starting, coming out of college or out of high school and going into the workforce could have as many as 15 different jobs in their working lifetimes today. And I stop and think about it. I, I've had a, a few employers in my life as well. So the idea of occupation is quite different from that of vocation, a calling. We can serve God in any place we go, whether it's in a, a computer IT shop in your company, or you happen to be uh, the person who takes the information off a telephone as a receptionist or a uh, a, 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 what do they call them today? The, uh, the folks that take information over the phone. Um, customer service representatives. Or a teacher, or a doctor, or a nurse, or a firefighter, a policeman, a janitor, a maintenance man. Each one of those are occupations. But in our ba baptism, we received a deeper call, a call to serve God. So we are to be, as Jesus calls us, disciples. We are to be salt and light. We are, in reality, to walk in the footsteps of the one who gave us his saltiness and brought us his own light. Discipleship truly is the effort to follow Christ, to walk in his footsteps, to carry his cross, to be 
Christ for the other as he is Savior to us. Paul tells us, put on the mind of Christ. He says that's the very last phrase of our second lesson. We have the mind of Christ. And he tells his churches that he will know nothing among them except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus doesn't speak in lots of different words than Paul, but the reality is we understand he uses a little bit different language. Jesus speaks in terms of the salt life. You ever seen those bumper stickers on cars as people drive around Jacksonville? I've always been kind of curious about what that meant. What is the salt life? I mean, I know lots of people move to Florida for this salt life. The idea that we live just minutes from the beach, from saltwater fishing and bodyboarding and surfboarding and all kinds of just general beach bum type activities. That's certainly the salt life, right? The things that Jimmy Buffett speaks about. You know, Flip-flops and short shorts even in February. Well, maybe not necessarily today, but generally the weather is good enough to do that. Is that the kind of salt life Jesus is calling us to? It sounds awful good, doesn't it? No, no, not quite. If we were to say that Jesus calls one to a salt life, I don't think it would necessarily look like going into a surf shop. Although one could work at a surf shop and certainly live the salt life Jesus talks about. In fact, I've even seen ministry groups, cell groups if you would, communities gathered around common interests like surfing or saltwater fishing and still be and still find the light of Christ and be able to communicate that. So you ask yourself, well, let's focus on what salt is in the first place. And we all know salt has lots of different purposes, right? I mean, we put it on our, our food, unless you're like me and the doctor smacks you on your knuckles when you think about doing that. Salt is truly something that adds flavor to food, but it's also a preservative. We know that they used to hang meat, not in cold locker rooms, where they would just hang the food and it would be 40 degrees because of refrigeration. No, before refrigeration, they could cover meat with salt and prevent it from going rancid so quickly. It's amazing the kinds of things that they can do with salt. We were having a conversation preparing as we normally do, the pastors and, and Vicar Tobias and I, we were sitting around and, and Vicar, with his medical knowledge, was sharing with us the, the idea of the things that salt do, does. It's a, almost like a, a magnet to liquid at times. The idea of what salt can do is pretty amazing. In fact, just near my own home, there's a new place that's just opened up. It's called the Salt Room. You ever heard of these things? Salt chambers where you can literally go in and breathe salt air and it's supposed to be good for the health. Isn't that interesting? The people pay lots of money to go and do those kinds of things. I don't have that kind of money. But nonetheless, I'm sure it's probably good for some people. It's part of that salt life. You know, go down by the beach and just breathe in the salt air. I wonder, is it, could Jesus have meant, when we go out into the world, we are to live and breathe as he did, to follow in his footsteps, to be a preservative and flavoring for a, a world that has become bland and, and tasteless in all senses of that word. We can watch many things going on in our culture today and say, mm, that was a pretty tasteless move. But we are to remain salty in these pursuits of following Jesus. It seems like it sounds pretty easy for salt to lose its flavoring. In fact, you think it can. It can indeed do that. If it's losing its taste, of course, it becomes absolutely worthless. 
Jesus was warning us what happens when disciples fall away or cease to find their identity in him. I mean, ultimately, brothers and sisters, that is what we're doing right here, right now. Drawing near to God in the same way he has drawn near to us. We've come to get our own weekly salt fix, if you will. Because we are drawing near to the one who makes us the salt of the earth. Jesus tells us also he came to fulfill the law. And he does so perfectly. We are sinners, of course, in need of a savior. And as such, we don't have a righteousness of our own. Our righteousness is not excessive at all. Jesus is speaking to everyone when he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, the truth is, none of our righteousness is excessive, is it? The truth is, we have his. It is his righteousness. When we identify with him, when we draw near to him, when we hear those blessed words, Of our own forgiveness. He is giving us his righteousness. And it is a blessing indeed. When our saltiness, our light, originates with Christ, what is his becomes ours. And we are, if you will, what we eat. We gather together around a meal. The true body and blood of Christ So what is it that this salt life looks like for us? How do we live it in the world? Well, Isaiah talks a great deal about that, I think. Is the salt life a a, a religious life? I mean, do we do the right religious things? Make the right sacrifices? Say the right prayers? Do the right things? Is that the salt life? Not so fast, my friends. Isaiah the prophet rightfully points out. Indeed, it really kind of starts with what we talked about last week in the first lesson, the Old Testament lesson. What is it that God calls you to do but to walk with God humbly, to love, to do justice, and to love kindness? In many ways, Isaiah continues that thought from the prophet Micah of last week. He continues on when he says that the salt life in reality looks like an acceptable fast. What is an acceptable fast but to loose the bonds of wickedness? To let the oppressed go free. To share your bread with the hungry. To satisfy the desire of the afflicted. Then, he says, shall your light break forth like the dawn. This is truly the essence of the salt life. As we go forward, and we will over the next couple of weeks, continue to reflect on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus will really lay out what that salt life looks like. And interestingly enough, as we've gotten into the 20th century in Lutheranism, we have this idea that the law, well, not so much anymore. But Jesus says, no, I haven't come to do away with the law. But we understand our ability to keep the law is imperfect within us. We kneel down and admit what it is that troubles us. We know our sin. And while it would be nice if we could just say, well, you really don't have to do that. That's not what is said. Paul doesn't release the Christian from the the law itself, he simply reminds us that God's grace is sufficient. When we repent of our sins, return to him, we can grow deeper into Christ only through the Spirit's work. That is why his grace is sufficient for us. The essence of the Christian vocation is relying upon God to use us as his tools in the world. And the disciple can only do this in relationship to the triune God. Therefore, community is important. 
we understand to be effective tools in the hands of God, we have to be used both individually where we're at, but importantly as well communally. We know two heads are truly better than one. So the salt life is a community life. We don't walk this path by ourselves. We do it together, caring for each other. Remember, Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. But also in caring for the world as well. Love thy neighbor or the parable of the Good Samaritan. Certainly those individuals in that story were not part of a community. But caring, the Good Samaritan stopped and gave aid. From this life and calling of the disciple, we shall not be moved by God's spirit and his dwelling in us. The heart is steady. Do not be afraid, the psalmist says, referring to the lifetime commitment that Christian vocation represents. We live in a commitment phobic culture today. The salt life is not a period of time. It's a total lifetime invitation. Called, of course, by Christ out of the world to be prepared and sent back in. To be in the world, but not of the world. Because we know that salt can indeed lose its taste. It's interesting that the Greek word there, tasteless, can also mean foolish. But only when we cease to be disciples of Christ's word and become influenced by materialism and the self-serving philosophies of this, war, of this age do we begin to become tasteless. Christ calls us, of course, and gathers us in our baptism. He feeds us and nourishes us in communion with one another so that we can venture out into the world and spend our lives in devotion and commitment proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Words without deeds like salt become useless or light under a basket. Words spoken in praise of God need support of our very own hands. Our hands, God's work. Jesus calls and gathers us in his church to witness by both word and deed, even as God reveals that he is our father when he calls us as his children. Into his body we have been called. Having heard the stories of salvation. The light is revealed to us. And from this place we are sent out to be salt and light for the world. Charged with the sacred joy and duty. To proclaim the coming of the kingdom of God. As Christ shares his mission with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us take a moment to reflect on God's word and his will for our lives.